Hi, my name is Marcus and welcome to Recess. My guest today is Louisa Thomas Engel, an Associate Professor in Education from James Cook University in Townsville, Australia. Her research focuses mostly on science and sustainability education in both the middle school and pre-service context. Further, her research explores the concepts of curricula and pedagogical approaches such as blended learning and the flipped classroom. And flipped classrooms is what Louisa is here to talk to us about today. Thank you, Louisa. Thanks, Marcus, for the opportunity to talk to you about my research today on flipped classrooms. Um, pleased to be sharing the findings of our paper that examined specifically whether pre-service teachers were prepared for a flipped classroom approach. So we know that teaching and learning in higher education is becoming increasingly complex. And while universities are charged with producing graduates who are creative, critical thinkers who are able to synthesize and respond to complex socio-ecological problems, they're also under pressure to offer innovative and engaging approaches to teaching and learning in a highly competitive market, while catering to an increasingly diverse student cohort as they transition into higher education. Blended learning approaches have long been explored as an, as an innovative way of offering flexible and engaging learning environments. They offer students choice over how they learn and when. And blended approaches may be described as partly tangible, partly virtual. So in other words, they purposefully and effectively integrate technology enhanced learning across physical and virtual environments. Flipped or inverted classrooms are an example of a blended learning approach that reverses more traditional styles of teaching and learning in higher education. Specifically, it employs direct computer-based individual instruction outside the classroom and interactive group learning activities inside the classroom. The research that I'm sharing with you today explored the affordances of a flipped learning approach in a core first year unit in the Bachelor of Education at James Cook University. Prior to introducing a flipped approach, teaching and learning in the unit employed a traditional approach comprised of a two hour mass lecture, followed by a one hour tutorial conducted in smaller groups of about 25 students. Unit delivery was also supported by a learning management system that housed online learning resources and, resort and readings. ED1411 is a first year unit that explores a range of socio-ecological challenges organised in six learning modules with consideration of classroom pedagogy. It has a strong focus on the science that underpins these socio-ecological challenges and the development of student scientific literacy. The experience of my colleagues and I found that students experience significant difficulties engaging with and learning the key concepts and issues explored in the unit. So we thought we might try to adopt a flipped learning approach with a view to address this problem. The flipped approach that we enacted comprises of a suite of short videos of about five minutes each focused on the more tricky concepts explored in the unit. We also provided a short introductory video that explained our rationale for the flipped approach, what flipped learning is and our experiences and our expectations, sorry, for students engaging in flipped learning in ED1411. Given that some of our lecture content was now taught before class via the short videos, the corresponding lecture content was replaced with a student-centered activity that required students to recall, apply and extend their learning in keeping with the tenets of a flipped classroom. So here's one example of what this might have looked like. You can see that um, in this example here that we have a key concept, the introduction of the greenhouse effect, how it occurs and why. Um, and that would have been covered in the flipped video with the corresponding in-class activity, engaging students in an activity where they drew a label diagram that illustrated the greenhouse effect. They compared, they discussed, they refined their, their diagrams with a neighbouring pair. And then they were asked to complete a KWL, KWL chart. What do I know? What do I want to know? What do I want to learn more about? Um, to, I guess, inform next steps for us as instructors. The aim of our study was to investigate how a flipped learning approach supported pre-service teachers' engagement and learning in ED1411. We were particularly interested in how students engage with the flipped videos how the video supported students' learning of key concepts in the subject, 
and what students thought about the approach. We were also really interested in how students engaged with the flipped learning approach that we adopted. We employed a triangulation mixed methods research design where the data was collected via a student survey, our observations of teaching and a narrative account of our experiences recorded in a reflective journal. A total of 171 students responded to the survey over two subject deliveries, which represented an average response, response rate of around 36%. Here's a summary of the student survey. You can see that it asked a range of questions that concerned how students engaged with the flipped videos and why, and their perceptions of a flipped learning approach. Our data analysis revealed five key findings. The first was that the majority of students watched the flipped videos more than once, and generally prior to attending class, which painted an encouraging picture of students' engagement with the flipped videos. While no one indicated that they watched all of the videos, less than 6% indicated that they watched the videos at all. The average number of views per video was about two to two and a half. More watched the videos um, more than once for weeks three and 10, which could be due to the more challenging nature of the topics in those weeks. And we were also encouraged to find that about 97% of students indicated that they would revisit the videos in preparation for the final exam. Now, in terms of when students watch the videos, more than 80% viewed them before class, which is what you would expect in a flipped learning approach. But it was interesting to find that nearly 40% watched the videos after class. Students could select more than one response to this survey question. And given that students generally watch the videos more than, more than twice, um, it's likely that they viewed the videos at different times, like perhaps before and after class. About 11% indicated that they watched the videos at other times, including during the lectures themselves. Um, and you can hear, see here some examples of the explanations that students offered as to when they watched the videos. A common theme was the need to juggle multiple commitments like work and study. And for others, it was dependent on the content of the video and what they deemed as being important to watch. The second key finding was that a perceived lack of time was why a significant minority of students didn't watch one or more of the flipped videos before class. Again, reasons here concern juggling other commitments like completing assessment. And another concerning reason was that they simply forgot to watch them. In spite of this, the third key finding to arise from our study was that nearly 99% of respondents perceived that viewing the flipped videos helped them to understand the key concepts in ED1411. And this reaffirmed our reasons for introducing a flipped approach in the first place. Students reported that the videos were helpful because they provided in-depth, clear and concise explanations of key concepts. They used visual representations of information like diagrams and illustrations, and they could pause and replay the videos so that learning could occur at their own pace. Our fourth key finding was that students' opinions were divided on whether a flipped learning approach motivated them to learn or whether it was a preferred approach over traditional lectures. While most students agreed that the, the approach motivated them to learn, nearly a third neither agreed nor disagreed that a flipped approach was motivating or did not believe that the approach motivated them at all. Similarly, while half reported that the approach was more engaging than traditional lectures, a third of respondents were neutral and nearly 15% did not agree that flipped learning was more engaging. When students were asked to nominate their preference for a flipped classroom over traditional lectures, more than half were either undecided or said that they didn't prefer a flipped classroom in place of regular lectures. Overall, most students appeared to respond positively to the flipped classroom approach, with approximately three quarters disagreeing with the notion that they wouldn't recommend a flipped classroom approach. The final key finding to emerge from the study came from our reflections on practice. We found that, the, that significant teacher-led instruction, scaffolding and guidance were required in class to review the concepts explored in the flipped videos and to support students to complete the active learning task successfully. 
We found very early in the semester that we were required to adjust our plans as students weren't coming to class as prepared as we had anticipated. We had to engage in further direct teaching of concepts explored in the flipped videos, which involved providing further explanations of learning content, drawing diagrams, re-watching parts of the videos, and asking lots of questions. Importantly, we also discovered that additional guidance and scaffolding was required to complete the planned student-centred activity successfully, as students' knowledge was tested in new and unfamiliar contexts. So it came to be that we had to adjust our flipped learning approach as follows. Students were still expected to engage with the flipped videos prior to attending lectures. However, we planned to revisit and reteach some of the content of the flipped videos using direct instruction and questioning during class time. Once we had checked for understanding, students progressed to the planned activities to apply their knowledge with guidance and support. So what were some of the key learnings to emerge from our research? First, we were required to think more carefully about the affordances and challenges of a flipped learning approach in the context of our first year science and sustainability unit. While the survey findings revealed a high level of engagement with the videos, it was clear that other factors got in the way, such as students' time or their sketchy memory. For us, these findings highlight the importance of supporting students in the first year experience as they manage multiple commitments and convey clear expectations to encourage them to take responsibility for their own learning outside of class time. Now, regarding whether a flipped classroom motivated students to learn was more engaging than traditional instruction or whether students preferred a flipped approach over traditional lectures, it was interesting to find that students' opinions were divided. First year students might resist taking control of their learning due to their previous secondary school experiences, which shape their learning expectations and their perceptions of the teacher's role. Some research has also found that school leavers may not be willing to engage in online course components, particularly if they elect to study on campus. It's also interesting to assume that while students might prefer the flexibility and student centeredness of a flipped learning approach, other research suggests that traditional lectures might be preferred because they're familiar, comfortable, teacher-centred and require little active participation. Sally Kift is an Australian scholar who has done some significant work in the first year space and she suggests the need for a transition pedagogy where first year curriculum supports students transition into, into higher education. A transition pedagogy should include opportunities for active and collaborative learning but the findings in our study suggest that disrupting students' expectations of uni university may be met with some resistance. While students reported high levels of engagement with the flipped videos, they were unable to engage with the planned activities without further direction in class. Our findings left us wondering whether our flipped learning aspirations were a case of too much too soon. Had we taken the training wheels off only to leave students falling off their bicycles? Noting that curriculum delivery, particularly in the context of the first year experience, should support students transition from their previous educational experience to the nature of learning in higher education and learning in their discipline, we decided that some teacher-led instruction might be warranted in a flipped learning approach, depending on students' backgrounds, learning needs and progress through their degree. Given that secondary school education is often dominated by transmission pedagogies, it seems that measures to adapt the flipped classroom to mediate this transition might be warranted. To this end, my colleagues and I proposed a flip learning continuum with a view to offer a new direction in the discussion on best practice for flipping the classroom in ways that best support students' engagement and learning particularly in conceptually demanding units and those for which students are underprepared. The continuum proposes that students' learning needs might call for different levels of teacher-led instruction and scaffolding, student autonomy, knowledge application and extension. You can see here that traditional instruction is positioned on the left-hand side. Here, lectures are content-driven with a focus on knowledge acquisition and lower order thinking. 
Students can apply and extend knowledge, usually through problem solving exercises that are set for homework. On the right hand side of this continuum is the flipped classroom, which is characterised by high levels of student autonomy and higher order thinking. In the middle of the continuum, you can see that there are learning environments that draw on aspects of both traditional and flipped learning approaches. This is where we situate teaching and learning in ED1411. In this approach, students engage with videos to acquire new knowledge before class, but their classroom experiences are supported by teacher-led instructions. Student-centred activities in class are carefully led and scaffolded. You can see that there are two arrows at the top of the continuum, which suggest that a move from traditional lectures to a flipped classroom might occur over time, depending on students' learning needs and their progress through the degree. We propose that students are less likely to have the skills, knowledge and capacity to learn through an entirely flipped approach early in their degree. And this is supported by our experiences in ED1411. Postgraduate students, on the other hand, are often more motivated and committed to study in higher education than undergraduate students. Higher levels of autonomy and self-direction could be afforded to third and fourth year students who are more likely had to have developed the necessary skills and motivation to learn independently and to engage successfully with an entirely flipped approach. So to conclude, while this study was conducted in an initial teacher education context, its findings we think are useful in informing the development of affected flipped learning approaches in higher education more broadly. Given that it can be tricky to identify when, under what circumstances and in what ways a flipped learning approach might be a good pedagogical choice, the findings of this study shed some light on important pedagogical considerations when seeking to engage first year students in flipped learning. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I, I got lost in it in a, in, a, in a fantastic way because what you're describing is very much what we're doing. And I would like to add further to your study in this coming year by collecting similar, uh, well, asking similar questions of the postgraduate students that we're teaching. Uh, so I, I found it fascinating. And I, I have only one small question because I think you articulated everything, you know, amazingly well uh, is in regards to the length of video so where this comes from is i just built a course where i knew the video content was too long yeah. but there was no way about it these were interviews and they they had to be you know one of them was an hour and a half long i didn't expect the people the, the students to watch it in one go mm -hmm. um but <clears throat> that was that was the only option so mm -hmm. i have the the access to the data for those videos on YouTube and I can see when people drop off and at what point <laughs> and it's really interesting because uh, I, well, I can see I can see what people do but with your students you said you kept them quite short about five minutes um, right. was there any information collected on the length of videos and how that engaged students in, in the learning process we thought we'd decide to provide videos that didn't require too much out of time, um, out of class preparation. So all they had to do was watch the videos, they supplemented their readings and so forth, um, and we kept it nice and short. So interesting to have the high levels of engagement, but still students saying, you know, I'm too busy, too busy for a five minute video. Um, so that's always the tension, isn't it? Is presenting the content in a way that's accessible, engaging, um, and responses is responsive to their their diverse context, whether they're working or studying and doing all, a range of things. So yeah, I'd be interested to hear, Marcus, on how you go with those videos. And I note that you said you're working with postgraduate students, so quite a different cohort. So again, I'm interested to hear whether this idea of um, you know postgraduate students or students earlier um, having moved further through an undergraduate degree, say, um, whether they do have those higher levels of motivation to engage in that independent and autonomous learning before class. So um, one other follow up question in regards to your videos. Uh, did you with alongside the videos, 
create a way for students to interact with the content being taught in the lecture. So, for example, you're mm -hmm. discussing one of the key topics and it's a complex topic and you're expecting them to watch the video a couple of times. Was there a question raised in the video that students would then respond to on the LMS or through the video like a like a yeah. we use Mentimeter, but a, you know, a place to, to to store their idea in a, in a place so that the, the lecturer can then look at those responses before those scaffolding face-to-face -face workshops? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the at the end of each flipped video did have, you know, three or four short questions for the students to review their understanding. Um, and we conducted this study at a time where we didn't have access to technology like Mentimeter. So we're a little bit old fashioned, but what we asked students to do was to record their responses to those questions and bring them to class and initially their responses to the questions that they brought to class were intended to be a bit of a starting point so let's do a quick recap of the key ideas that you've learned before class and that's when it became abundantly clear that students hadn't hadn't i guess learned the way that we thought they would learn prior so i think you're right it's important to have some sort of questions for students to check their understanding distill the key ideas um, and, you know, to convey clear expectations that this is what you should have gleaned from the videos um, so that we have a shared foundation, a shared conceptual foundation before you come to class to move on to that higher order thinking. So I'm really, really thankful for your time, Louisa, and I'll let you get back to your evening. Uh, and thank you so much. No, thank you, Marcus. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, and I hope that was OK and you got everything you needed there.